Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Oscar, and I'm one of the co-founders of Mystic AI. But we'll talk about Mystic AI later. Today, now, what we're going to be talking about is several things. So one, something that I'm very, very passionate about, which is how do we optimize the cost of running AI models? And to do that, we're going to be covering two of the main um, technologies that we can do in order to achieve that. So one of them being GPU fractionization. So we'll cover what is that, why is important, and how to actually achieve that. Spot instances, what are they? The good, the bad, and the not so good. Um, and then examples and cost analysis of like using these two techniques and how much money actually some of our customers are able to save through leveraging some of these two technologies. And then, you know, what is mistake and what is that we do? So in terms of GPU fractionization, so what is fractionizing a GPU? Basically, it's all about how you can maximize the memory of a GPU and how you can run multiple things on parallel on the same GPU. And NVIDIA supports several like techniques in order to achieve that. But we're going to be talking and covering the two main ones currently being used, which are time slicing and multi-instance GPU, or also name, uh, known as MIG. And so what is time slicing? So time slicing, for those that might be familiar already with how CPU uh, processing power works, it's basically say that you have multiple models. So here I'm showing you four models. So that you have multiple models that you want to run concurrently on a GPU. In order to do that, uh, through time slicing, basically what they do is what time slicing on, on NVIDIA works is you're able to run chunks of that GPU, chunks of that model, the inference a bit by, by time. So like on every timestamp, you're able to run something from the first model, next timestamp, the second model, et cetera, et cetera. And so you basically run a bit of each inference, and then eventually you add up all these inferences, and then these four models have run simultaneously, so to speak. But they're not actually running simultaneously. It's just a bit of it from each of them on every single timestamp. Now, as I'm saying these things, probably are like realizing some of the good things and, and the bad things. So the bad things is that you're actually not really physically splitting anything. And so what some of the drawbacks that we've seen is that when you use time slicing for running multiple models on a single GPU, uh, you actually get into issues like OOM, so out of memory errors, because event effectively, like all these models are sharing the same GPU. So you can imagine if you have like llamas, whispers, and several models running there, they're all using the same memory. And should you have a big prompt, then that might cause an out of memory error. And so that is one of the drawbacks, is the, the likelihood of out-of-memory issues happening. Um, and then obviously, if one thing, like one some, something happens on one of the models, then it may affect all the other models. So if you say, imagine one of your customers or one of your users runs the model and affects that GPU, then it's going to affect all these other, uh, models that are also running on that same GPU. So we don't like that. Now, the good thing about time slicing is that it's widely adopted, uh, widely supported by all of these uh, different types of GPUs. And we'll cover on why this is important or the limitation of the other technique. Um, and so we've seen cases where like one is able to actually run uh, on T4s and V100s, multiple models, especially uh, maybe non-LLM based type of like models or very small embedding models or like models like Whisper, where like you actually have quite a lot of like left memory on that GPU. And so running many of those on you know, that same GPU becomes very beneficial. And so you actually are able to run multi many, many models on that same GPU through time slicing. The other technique that we really like, uh, it's called multi-instance GPU, or MIG. Now, the beauty of MIG is that actually it's more like a physical separation um, at the hardware and software level of like the memory and the compute cores of a GPU. And so what that brings into, into the game is that actually you can think of these fractions as individual GPUs, as completely different GPUs as if you were like just a fresh uh, small array 100 and, and so on and so on. Now, the problem with this is that potentially, as I mentioned, is like actually only supporting a specific architecture. So uh, with A100s, H100s, and H2100s, this is supported. But then on other older versions of GPUs, this is not supported. Now, the beauty is that because these GPUs usually have like up to 80 gigabytes, you can actually do a lot with 80 gigabytes uh, when it's non 
large uh, language models and many use cases where many people don't need to go as big as those big models. Um, and so the beauty here is that compared to time slicing, where like you were running a bit of each model on every timestamp, here you can actually on the same timestamp run four, should you have four models on each one on each partition of a GPU, then you can actually run concurrently four models, which is great. So in this case, you can already see the TLDR of, of the make, but it's basically on a single GPU paying a single GPU, you're actually running uh, four instances of, of the same model or different model. Now, the beauty of this is that you won't have the effect of one out of memory error on one of the GPUs to affect the other. So we really like that. And so the ability of running concurrently uh, multiple models on the same GPU with make, it's actually a much more safe method of achieving that. Now, one of the problems is also how many partitions, so how many divisions of a, of a GPU you can have, you can achieve with make. And in the case of make, it's up to seven GPU partitions. So you can think about like an A100 with 80 gigabytes, you could be partitioning it uh, with chunks of like 10 gigabytes uh, each partition. Now, let's look at some of the potentially not so great, but actually still like really good uh, things about like running concurrently, leveraging make uh, on these uh, GPUs. And so uh, what I did basically was like a, a review of like, you know, should you have multiple instances of Llama 3, 8 billion, what would be the actual like inference speed? So for this experiment, uh, I've used the inference engine xlama v2. For those not so familiar about it, it's basically a very well optimized inference engine, especially excels running quantized models. And also when you're using a batch size of one, so you're not like, parallelizing multiple requests on the same um, model at the same time. Um, like for instance, you need to make sure you can't just like, for instance, for a chatbot, you can't be running multiple prompts because it's all sequential. So you would be using a batch size of one, but for things like summarization of multiple texts, you can actually have batched, which would effectively be a lot more uh, efficient. So Xlama in here shines specifically with batch size one, when the model is quantized and when the model fits in the entire GPU. So this is perfect for the fractionization of the GPUs because we are looking at quantizing these models such that they fit on a given memory amount on that GPU. And so for this example, I'm running Llama 3 8 billion on an A100 with 80 gigabytes and it's 2.5 bit quantized using Xlama uh, quantization and as I mentioned, is about the size of one. Now, all of these, the inference of this model is six gigabytes, which if we, we look at the potential slices, then if we know that and we can slice it up up to seven slices, then we could be able to fit this Lama 3, 8 billion on a slice of 10 gigabytes, which is what we see here. And so if we were to have seven Lama 3B parallel running a single GPU, then per fraction of GPU, we would be getting a response of 43 tokens per fraction, which simultaneously you could have under a single GPU, seven users talking to the same model. And in total, it would be a throughput of 300 tokens per second in total. But depends on the use case, what people like to see is the metric of like per customer, what is the, the tokens per second that I'm getting. In this case, you would be getting 43 tokens per second. And as we reduce the slices of the GPU, we see that the, the the average tokens per second also increases. And the reason that is, is because you are not only dividing the memory, but also dividing the compute cores. So basically the cores in the GPU that actually process those matrix multiplications and, and other uh, operations required to do the inference of these uh, models. And so effectively, you're also limiting how much compute capability that GPU, that fraction of a GPU has, not just the memory, but also the compute capability. Now, interestingly, at some point, you see that like, even if you were to be giving more compute cores to this fraction, the amount of tokens per second doesn't linearly increase. And that is because you actually get to a point where the bottleneck is moving data from where it's stored to the compute cores. Um, and so that's why we see between the two slices and the one slice, it's not that much of a difference. Now, here's the beauty, right? You, one is able to achieve 100 tokens per second with a single sample so batch size one so a single like request input and one output 
uh, parallelize 100 tokens per second. So simultaneously, you can get that kind of uh, throughput, which is, is really, really good. And if we run the same experiment with Llama 3, 70 billion, so now the 70 billion occupies uh, 38 gigabytes, not six gigabytes as the Llama 3, 8 billion, um, then we see if you were to be using the entire GPU, you would be getting a 25 tokens per second. This is using X Llama again. One could potentially get different tokens per second should they be using TensorT or VLLM or other like more optimized for batch inference um, and, and inference engines. Um, and so here is because you're dividing by two the amount of compute cores, then you are also effectively dividing by two. Uh, how many tokens per second these models are able to be processed on a fraction of a GPU. However, having said that, it is known that like beyond 10 tokens per second, it's already twice the speed of the human read readability. So how quickly we read words. So like beyond 10 tokens per second, you're already like, you know, beyond good to gen to have a chatbot that doesn't feel like this is too slow, I'm gonna change and go to a different product. And so the good thing about this is that actually you can run Llama 3, 70 billion on a single A100, uh, 80 gigabytes, quantizing it to four bit, which actually turns out that like you are able to not lose too much of the quality of the model uh, all the way till four bit more or less, which is great. And so that means that actually the model that people would be experiencing when it's quantized is almost as good as the model should not be quantized and run in half precision or even potentially full precision. There's a measurement for that, which is called perplexity, but that goes beyond this, um, this talk. Um, so yeah, so this is an example of like some of the performance um, changes that happen when you run these models on a fraction of a GPU. And here we just looked at Llama 3, 8 billion and 70 billion while running on a 180 gigabytes. Right. The other cost optimization that we wanted to talk about, uh, so we talked about GPU fractionalizing, basically how many models you can run on a single GPU. The big one other is spot GPUs. And so for those that are not familiar with spot GPUs, basically they're GPUs that just like on demand, they have the same performance and just run exactly the same way, but the difference is how they are terminated. And the main difference is that the cloud provider at any point can take out those GPUs from your pool of available GPUs. And the reason is because these GPUs are like extra GPUs from the cloud provider that they just offer to you as a way to just get some money out of the GPUs while there's not too much demand for them. And so each cloud provider is gonna have a different rate of how quickly they're gonna remove it out of you. Usually it's around 5, 10% of probability that they remove it. So it's actually fairly low. So you can actually um, quite confidently rely on spot GPUs, which is really, really, really good. Um, because depending on the cloud provider, you can get up to 10x cheaper of than on-demand GPUs. Uh, and so as I was saying, like this spot GPU is basically a GPU that at any point the cloud provider can remove them. They do give you like an alert. So in the case of AWS, it's 60 seconds. They tell you, hey, I'm about to remove this GPU, do something, GCP is 30 seconds, zero 30 seconds. So you can use these signals to figure out, okay, now I need to spin up a new GPU because this one is about to get removed by the cloud provider. Now, when should we use uh, spot GPUs? Obviously, when cost is the number one priority. When inference requests are potentially less than 30 seconds, even though uh, this is the case for most of the inference that we see um, running. Uh, so most of the use cases can run easily on spot GPUs. Also, obviously, spot GPUs have been like widely known to be used for batch inferences. So basically, things that like you know the user is not expecting something immediately, kind of like real time, but instead it's like at some point giving me the the result, and when it's done, I'm happy. And if it's like a few seconds, the minute, then spot is absolutely magnificent. If it was to be like a real time streaming app, then there might be the case that that GPU disappears, but should you have a good uh, system in place, a good platform in place, then a new request should be parallelly being requested to that cloud provider to give you a new GPU because that one is about to disappear. Um, and then when you're handling high traffic, also is pretty good because you basically have effectively so many GPUs up and running that if one is to disappear, then 
uh, you know, the, the lag that it is effective to that end user because it's going to be rooted. If you have a, a queue in place, it's going to be rooted to another available GPU. Then that kind of lag doesn't really affect too much at the end customer. So kind of like to summarize, uh, the benefits about spot GPUs is that they can be particularly cheaper. Now, the drawback is that they're slightly riskier, um, but there's ways that you can mitigate that. So let's look at a bit of the pricing. As I mentioned, like depends on the spot GPU is going to be different. Now, this is something that like internally at Mystic, we do have like a real time kind of like table of like seeing the prices of all GPUs across different cloud providers. And so we see what is the, the cost of these GPUs. And here I just wanted to show the specific cases of like A100 because they're widely used uh, for LLMs and image generation and video generation, all the generation kind of like generative AI applications. So in the case of AWS, interestingly, they don't support single GPUs. So it's only access to a cluster of eight GPUs. Now, if you were use, if you were to be using a cluster of eight A100 40 gigabytes, spot is six times cheaper than on demand in the case of AWS. And for the A100 80 gigabytes, unfortunately, AWS does not support um, spot instances. For GCP, uh, we see that they're actually around three times cheaper for both A100 40 gigabytes and A100 80 gigabytes. They do give you access to a single GPU, which is really good for many use cases. But you can see um, that the amount of money saving is, is quite significant, being three times. And then we go to the king of the savings when it comes into running uh, spot instances, which would be Azure. Now, Azure works slightly different to the other cloud providers, which they work in a bidding system. So you basically say, I'm going to pay this amount of money. And then if Azure decides, yes, I'm going to give it to you for that money, unless someone else bids for a higher amount of money, then you're not going to get that GPU so quickly. So you can configure basically the bidding amounts so that like it goes potentially up to on demand. Uh, but if you don't configure that accordingly, then you may be spending even more than on demand. Um, but Many times, in most of the cases, you're able to beat at 10 times, nine times, or eight times less than uh, what on-demand costs. And it becomes extremely cost-affordable to run on spot instances with Azure. Uh, when, it <clears throat> when it comes into 40 gigabytes, just like uh, AWS, they only give you eight A100s. But on A180 gigabytes, they do give you access to a single A180 gigabytes. So instead of paying the on-demand price of $3.6 per hour, you would be able to pay $0.36 per hour, um, the minimum, so to speak, of the bid that would be, which is really, really good. OK, so I guess this kind of like goes into the, the thought of like, right, we see that there's really good pricing for spot instances. There's really good potential optimizations from uh, fractionalizing GPUs. So should I use spot instances and GPU fractionalization? Well, the answer is it depends. So it's kind of like a function of like how many requests are you handling per second? What is the VRAM of your pipelines? So that will answer you whether you're able to actually fractionalize those spot instances and run them on each of those fractions. And what is the cost that you're targeting to run your entire application? And for that, I think it's really good to go through actual real use cases and actual real examples. And so here in front of us, what we have is an example of like a company that generates images as a service. And so um, in this case, the customer has a pipeline of like an SDXL variant. This model, it requires around 20 gigabytes of inference. It's currently targeting around 2.5 million requests per day. And each of these requests take more or less 2.5 seconds. And so these are some of the numbers that when we talk to our potential customers we like to understand because this helps us figure out how many GPUs you may need and whether those can be running on uh, fractions and how much money you could be saving should you be using spot instances. And so for this use case, uh, the customer was actually using uh, a tens. So, but I wanted to just like have a normalized kind of like example of should they want to use A100s, what would be the cost of running this? And so uh, with A100s, should they be running all of this? So in order to figure out how many GPUs this customer needed, we only needed to multiply the request per second that they are handling times the inference uh, that each of these requests take. And that will effectively tell you how many GPUs you need 
at all times in order to effectively hit those metrics. And on demand, it tells us that like they needed 73 GPUs. And in this case, as I mentioned, uh, for just simplicity of the example on A100, now that should you be running on on-demand, it would be a cost of 155K a month. So in order to maintain this product, this specific generative AI application, then they needed to be paying 155K a month. However, as I mentioned, this use case was on A10, so they're actually paying like around 19K a month. Now, if we enable what we call the spot fractionization and uh, sorry, spot and GPU fractionization, then you would be reducing running on A100 80 gigabytes all the way to 20. And that is because we're basically effectively running this as the Excel variant up to 20 gigabytes of memory, four of them on the same GPU. And so suddenly you're able to like reduce by at least four times the number of GPUs that you use. And then if you add how many, like all of these running on spot instances, then should the bidding system be at the lowest, then you can have a 36 times reduction in cost while still meeting the requests per day that this customer wanted to, to be able to hit. And so there's a massive amount of cost saving by uh, enabling these spot instances and GPU fractionization. If we look at another example uh, for this company that serves a chatbot, in this case, they're using a Llama 70 billion and an embedding model, which is a really common use case where you have these two systems or two models running uh, at the same time. And so if we look at the VRAM used during inference, uh, the Llama 70B is around 40 gigabytes and the embedding model is around eight gigabytes. The number of requests in this case was around 100K a day and the Llama 70 billion inference request to, takes around 20 seconds to process the entire uh, response and the embedding is just less than, than a second, like around half a second, et cetera. Um, also, there's a metric that I, I forgot to mention on the previous slide, but it's the GPU utilization. Now, the GPU utilization helps us figure out, like, are all these GPUs always running? Meaning, how often do you have a spike versus no spike? So, obviously, it's not like consistently requests that are always receiving, but there's certain like goals, ups and downs. And that's what we calculate on the utilization. So, all these numbers have utilization um, taken into consideration. So it reduces the amount of GPUs effectively because they're not running 100% of the time. So in this case, this customer uh, was running everything on A100, running this models, these two, model, this two models on different models. In order to achieve 100K per day, they needed to have 23 A100 80 gigabytes and two A100 40 gigabytes, which would eventually effectively be 70K a month. Now, if we do the same thing that we did before, but with spot and using fractionization, we're now able to run these embedding models on just a single 40 gigabytes, and then the Lama 70B on the A100 80 gigabytes and reducing by two the number of GPUs and running on spot, then it's now five times less money per month in order to still effectively be able to target those 100K requests a day. This is third example, and, and I wanted to be able to cover like the three main use cases that we're seeing. Uh, so we've seen uh, text, we've seen generation of images, and this one is processing audio, translating, and then processing audio back again. So for this pipeline, it, the use case is Whisper with Llama 3.8b to do the translation and then a text-to-speech uh, model to then take that translation back into speech again. And for all of these different models, the total VRAM is less than uh, 20, 20 gigabytes, which already you're thinking where this is heading, which is great. Now, the target that this customer had was 10,000 requests a day, up to four concurrent. And then the average inference time per request is around four seconds, still same GPU utilization. And if we look this, how much it would cost on A100s, on GCP, this would be having four GPUs up and running which is 8.5K per month on on-demand uh, A100s on GCP. And then if you look at the spot and fractions that transforms into a single A100, which massively reduces the cost and the overheads of running that infrastructure. So there's an eight times reduction by leveraging spot, fractionaliz spot and fractionalization of GPUs. So kind of as a summary, um, if we are able to combine if we look at just the CGPU fractionization, 
then we're obviously able to maximize utilization of GPUs by leveraging the rest of the memory available. And just for a slight exchange in degradation, and as we saw, the degradation in many use cases is not even that much because if it's a chatbot, as long as it's 10, 10 tokens per second is good enough, then you're able to reduce GPUs by twice, four times, or even seven times. And then if we look at spot instances, then one is able to reduce up to 10 times the cost of running these applications. However, it may be interrupted by cloud at any point. Now, the beauty is that you don't have to go for the two options, right? You can potentially combine them. You can only have one or the other. But if you were to combine, you know, looking at the example that we saw, we have up to 36 times cost savings. But again, it really depends on the use case. Usually it's at least four to eight times uh, cost reduction. So it's significantly cheaper to run your entire generative AI application leveraging these two technologies. Uh, and that's something I think like more and more companies are going to adopt um, in the near term. However, the complications of adopting these technologies is that actually usually requires overheads uh, on the DevOps team when it comes into running these systems. So that goes into, you know, who am I? What is Mystic? What is that we do? So basically, we at Mystic have been running and helping companies since 2019 figure out the infrastructure uh, of many companies. So before the days of ChatGPT, obviously there was still machine learning to be run. And so we were helping companies uh, through our serverless API, which was one of the first in the market back in 2020, which was to run AI models as a service. And you would pay only for the inference while running on our shared cloud. Now, over the many years, we've been iterating this entire serverless API. And one of the things that we see is that serverless APIs work until you hit a specific level of scale or you're starting to look at uh, uh, reducing the cost because at the end of the way serverless APIs work is that there's a premium charge on top of how much money it costs you to run that GPU on a given cloud provider. And so what we decided was like, hold on, we've been iterating this entire product, entire platform. And what we saw is that companies would eventually move out from serverless APIs into building their own platform. And so they would hire a team of DevOps engineers and engineers to figure out how to build this platform themselves. And so what we decided was let's package all of this technology into a platform that these companies can run directly in their own clouds. And so for many companies, they couldn't be sending workloads over to our shared cluster of GPUs. And so they needed something more safe and more secure. They also wanted, as I mentioned, like a bit more control on the cost and optimizing that. But also they wanted a certain level of control uh, of the infrastructure without really needing to build the entire MLOps platform themselves. And so what we decided was to package all of this software that we had been building for our own serverless API and offer it as a platform that runs directly in your own cloud. And it gives you that same serverless API experience that now runs directly on your own cloud account. So you can use your credits if you have credits, you can use your quotas if you have, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you a lot more flexibility when it comes to running models directly in your own cloud. And, and just a, kind of like an overview about the Mystic platform. So as I mentioned, this platform kind of like enables you to run these generative applications directly on your own cloud. It comes packaged with optimizations, like the two optimizations that we've just mentioned when it comes into cost, but many others. So we obviously have uh, spot, fraction, spot uh, instances and GPU fractionization out of the box. So it's very easy to have those running as part of your application. And then we also have other optimizations that we have in place. So you, know, we, you can obviously bring your own inference engines, whether it's Xlama, the one that I use for the example, or VLLM, TensorT, or whichever new one comes from the open source community. And then we also are optimizing our entire platform such that you get less cool starts that you may experience in other platforms. And this is coming up soon. So it's basically a Rust, high, high performance Rust um, Docker registry, which is going to be amazing. Um, and so we're basically packaging in this platform all of these optimizations. So you don't have to build up those them yourself. And all of this runs directly in your own cloud which is more secure and more private than having to send workloads over to a remote uh, cluster. We wanted to make sure that you didn't need the dependency of a DevOps engineer team or an engineer to actually manage your entire platform. 
And so what we decided was how can we enable this for data scientists that don't have experience in Kubernetes or other DevOps platform to have the full confidence that they are able to reliably deploy ML systems. And so what we did was package all of this into what we believe is quite a beautiful experience that is very easy to go from this is my model to API endpoint. In average, a couple of hours or an hour, you get that endpoint and it's running directly in your own cloud. It's scalable, it's been cost optimized, and you can scale it to hundreds of users depending on your uh, use case. And so behind the scenes, Mystic is a managed Kubernetes platform that runs directly on your own cloud without you having to hire a team of DevOps engineers. So how can we help you? Well, if you're running your own text, image, audio, or video AI application, we can probably help. We've seen that like many of these companies are running their own open source or fine tuned models or alternative pipelines, and they want an API out of it. Instead of having to spend too much time on figuring out the entire engineering infrastructure and architecture, you can just use Mystic and this week or next week, you can have your application up and running. As well as you know the analysis of cost analysis that I've done for some of the use cases of our customers, we can do that for you. And so we can analyze, you know, this is how much your current is spending, this is how much you could be saving with us. And we can do that as part of your entire um, onboarding of using our Mystic platform. But yeah, please do reach out um, and I'll be super happy to help. Feel free to reach out on my email. So or at mystic.ai or on my LinkedIn. And I'll be happy to help answer any queries or show you a demo of the entire platform. Thank you so much for listening. And by the way, if you have, I forgot to say, but like if you have any questions or drop a message and we should have a few more minutes to answer those questions. So feel free to ask anything if you want to. Okay, well, in that case, given that there's no questions, feel free to reach out to me, as I said, on LinkedIn and or email, and I'll be super happy to help. Hope you all have a good day. Bye.